you should be as involved in these conversations hmm. or as ticked off or as you know excited as I am. I'm not even a producer. I'm not an, yeah. even an artist. There needs to be more songwriters and producers yeah. and artists who are willing to band together. The fact there's no organizing body, is, I think, is telltale. I'm not saying it would fix everything, um, but it would definitely help get you know the community a little bit more aligned in some of the... The, the the pain points that I think you know a lot of people are seeing. Yeah, I mean that's dude, that's the exact like you know what we're still fighting about, and it all can be solved with innovation. Just someone caring for a little bit, just sitting back and saying, okay, let's let's wipe the slate clean. Yeah. Let's wipe the whiteboard. Let's let's wipe it clean. Let's start from scratch. Let's start from scratch, right? Um, they have the power to do that. It stars the foundation, the precedence. We flying flags in every city, global residence. And we killing off the masters. Ghetto slave driving bastards. We making hits faster than you could think. We're on the brink of revolution. All my indie music makers, here's your restitution. Uh, we got the game in a chokehold. Not paying the creators is a no-no. I got the smoke road for all the fam bam. Hey everyone, welcome to the Pay the Creators podcast. I'm Abe Batchon, the CEO of BeatStars, and today I got a special guest, an attorney, agent, artist and producer, advocate, entrepreneur. This guy has been advocating for music producers in the BeatStars community for many years, and I kind of can't wait to pick his brain. This is the first time I'm actually meeting Carl in person. Um, he's worked with the likes of Blast, Juni, Turn Me Up YC, who's also one of our guys, Section 8. Um, this dude has had the back of the community for a while. I'm so happy he's here in Austin, Texas with me. Welcome to the podcast, Carl Folks. I'm happy to be here, man. Happy to be here. Appreciate you coming, man. Yeah. Before we get into work shit, because we can always get into work shit, you know, but um, sometimes we don't just like step back and, and talk about some some of the things that make us who we are and some of the experiences that we've gone through, man. So I'm, I'm you know, you're an interesting person within our community that I've always kind of wanted to sit down and really have a face-to-face -face with. So I'm glad we're doing it at, um, at the podcast. But first, man, please tell us a little bit about where you're from, where you grew up. Give us a little origin story on, on Carl. Yeah, I'm from South Jersey, which is, you know, five, ten minutes from, from Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, a lot of what happened in Philly spilled over to, to South Jersey. So, um, and, and there's it's it's definitely marked by a city a uh, city called Camden, you know very very notorious city and uh you know I spent most of my life um, outside of Camden but you know I think you feel the 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 spirit of Camden Atlantic City uh, spots like that where I'm from so so South Jersey's an interesting place you know I, I don't think a lot of people um, make it out or believe in themselves um, so it's it's you know I, we 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 have we have a couple people who made it and we all know their names. Yeah, it's one of those places. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I remember watching, I don't know what TV show it was, or documentary on Camden. Yeah. And um, it was like, it was kind of sickening how it was such a, like a big police state in terms of surveillance, monitoring people's whereabouts, where they're going. People like were just kind of like locked in this like virtual prison within the city behind these cameras that were... And they had this whole, and then the police had this. Anyway, we don't have to get too deep into that, but it's yeah. kind of it's kind of weird how that city was. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it definitely was a guinea pig. I feel like for a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, I I remember they leave they removed like the central police force. Like they didn't have a Camden City police force. Um, it was just Camden County police. Um, so there was a bunch of things that kind of try to curb uh, the, the crime. Um, you know, some of it worked, some of it some of it really didn't work. So. Um, I think, you know, 10 years later, it's probably the city's probably still in the same place. And I think just like what's happening all across the country, it's just, you know, um, gentrification. You know, you, you start seeing the semblances in certain apartment buildings pulling up, you know, popping up near the water. Um, and, you, and you're just like, you know, I, I feel like for me, I'm always just trying to advocate and tell people, yo, it's coming. You know, protect your assets or get aggressive. You know, let's 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 keep it before, you know, some, you know, other, other people take it. Um. Yeah, man, that's, to me, I'm sorry, man, because I, I kind of, you know, I lived in Hayward, California, and there was a lot of crime in the East Bay where, where I grew up, and just hearing you talk about just casually people showing up in the water and death and crime and just as if it's like, you know, like a normal thing for all of us to like hear about and experience right. since, since we were little kids, that's some, 
that's some twisted shit to be honest with you. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Do you think um do you think that being exposed to those kind of stories, being exposed to um the tribulations your community was experiencing, you think that had a part in kind of your career path and this advocacy that you do? Kind of you feel like that's like uh, you know, you feel funny like that enough, ins- inspired you a little bit. I, I mean, I think you know, I I, I come from a two parent household, um, and again, most of my life I spent you know in in a town in Camden County that wasn't Camden, so I, I kind of had a um, a different vantage point from from a lot of people in the community. So I, I don't I don't think it shaped me that mm-hmm, way. I mm-hmm, think mm-hmm. I, I think what really shaped me was probably um, just realizing how. You know, I think you know the community had just been so down. We're 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 a culture and a community that's been just beaten down emotionally, spiritually. So we weren't. You know, I just wanted to change the the. I wanted people to be more aggressive. Like go get their, go get what you deserve. Like stop. You know, we're not victims, right? You know, whether you are a victim or not, um, you know, you can't really sort of approach life in with a victim mentality. For sure, yeah. for sure. Like you had a, you had a problem with the leverage points, right. and you had a you had a problem. You saw you saw like you just didn't like that where where people would just were in you know in bad positions to like defend themselves, right? Right? Yeah. That bothered you? Nah, for sure. I mean, yeah, you know, that's definitely the well, one of the things. But I think for me, I was just like, you know, you gotta. It's better you got to show people kind of there's a there's a way you know and I think it's important that like you know I, I teach you know I taught for for two years after uh, mm-hmm. kind of getting established in the music business I went back and taught at a, a, a local university Rowan University which is right inside it's like a South mm-hmm. Jersey University cool. so um, you know I'm working with these artists I'm working with these producers and I'm doing stuff maybe on a on a national scale but like you'll see my face like I'll be you'll see me at the mall I think that's I think that's really really important. We're going to get into that. That's the reason why you're here. Right. Because <laughs> if you didn't make yourself available and make yourself relatable to people there's um you're doing things unconventional. Right. And I, I think it's important. You you you're doing it the create you did it you did it the creator route. The I'm independent. Creative. Nah, I'm a creative, man. Come for on. For real. Nah, I am. I am for you're sure. For real. And yeah. and not a lot of not a lot of people in your field kind of is operating that way, you know what I mean? They're kind of too reserved working for these firms, but but before all that, before all that, um <clears throat> where where did you like was there anybody in your family that was in the legal field? Was nah, just no first, nobody? First lawyer, first lawyer. First lawyer in the family. Yeah, first lawyer in the family. <laughs> Damn, that's dope. Yeah. How does that feel? Uh it's cool. I mean, I, I think you feel like you're on the island a little bit. I think, you know, I think if you're if you're going for certain goals, um, you know, I, I just felt like I was on an island to some extent because I didn't probably have the, like, no one helped me file my law school applications. And, you know, I'm fi- trying to sign up for the LSAT and get the studying courses and, you know, what should I do? You know, all that stuff was, like, outside the home or outside the community, and which is, you know, not what wasn't conventional for me. Yeah. I mean, you're much more than a lawyer, though. Like, this is, that's, that's, that's just part of the. That's part of it, that's, yeah. That's paperwork. Whole, you know. Paperwork. <laughs> but, man, my, my, I had a cousin, I had a cousin who was a lawyer. And dog, I used to see him study um, like crazy. The type of work ethic, the type of like dedication that you have to have, even if you're not enjoying it, the you know the the hard part. I mean, some people do enjoy it though. Like I know, I know some lawyers that love to Me read, too. love to read, Me love too. to get deep yeah. and dig into the details of just like every little thing because that's that's where you make your bread and butter is actually like being that um, expert on that topic, right? Yeah. Um, do you think you feel like that work ethic that you had to put yourself through in school, and then also I think you know you were heavy into sports too, right? Um, you do you, what what part of that do you take with you through your everyday everyday living right now? Yeah, no, I, I think there's always a prerequisite, you know. I think just to even get you know a B right in law school, there's just like a level of work you have to put in, um, which is probably more thorough than, you know, um, you know, other school. I think the only other industry I probably would say that is a different beast is, you know, med school. You know, anybody trying to even take an MCAT, they're just like, you know, the MCAT's a whole different animal. Um, and you're talking about science courses, things like that. So, I mean, for, for, for law, it's really just reading, um, you know, and, you know, writing, uh, writing, reading comprehension, writing, analysis, all that stuff. So I think if naturally you're good at that or um, I think it's tough to pick that stuff up. I think it's hard to learn how to be a good lawyer or 
you know, and you can, you can, you can improve, improve your reading comprehension, but mm-hmm. for some people, that's just not their strong suit, right? So, um, I think early on in your law school process, you you learn whether you have those reading comprehension skills, um, or you don't. Yeah. You always been reading? Yeah, I was. You know, my my dad. I I remember me and my brother. We lived in like a like a like a three bedroom kind of uh, apartment, uh, like you know condominium mm-hmm, in. Mm-hmm. You know, me and my brother shared rooms like for the majority of our life because my dad had like a, a book room, like a li- library. Don't touch the library. Yeah, don't touch the library. <laughs> <laughs> then we got older. I was like, come on, man. You got to, you know, we got to get this library out the paint. You know, we can't, we too big just to be sharing a room. Um, would, would he go in there and like pick stuff out for you guys to, to read? I, I, he would more so just say what you, what do you, for, for the longest time in my life, I thought I was going to be an architect. So, you know, I read, you know, I was reading architecture books from 10 years old to 18. Like really seeking those classes out, seeking wow. those like extracurriculars, and um, and so so we go to the stores or we order like these like AutoCAD you know CADs mm-hmm. of programming. Yeah. Um, so you know I was proficient in CAD probably at like 15, 16 years old, um, and that was just him just kind of supporting whatever. All right, you wanted to you want to do, be architect here. He's, here are the best architecture schools, you know. Um, so so there was support in that in that in that regard. That's dope. Yeah. That's dope. So encourage you to develop develop a skill, man, at yeah. a young age. That's dope. They, you could probably take with you, you know, everywhere with For sure. De- de- just developing skills, developing skill. It don't you don't no matter yeah. what you do. Yeah, um, I agree. At a at a um, at a law school, you did you go straight to working into Bloomberg or how, where like you were you like wh- where did you start? Where did you just where did you start your your career? Yeah, my, my, my law school journey was funny, man, because I think uh, all through law school I wanted to work in entertainment i just couldn't just couldn't crack i couldn't crack in it was just really i couldn't get mm-hmm. there was no beat stars for me that you know mm-hmm. intern at or mm-hmm. um you know so it, i just didn't get that opportunity so i did a lot of weird stuff in law school like i was i was a i was a legal intern for the mta in new york mm-hmm. which was like yeah, uh, that's the transportation right? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like you know the subway i was yeah. the legal intern yeah. for the subway which is crazy um and then you know i was like a legal intern for like the uh, district attorney's office, you know, in Jersey. So it was, like, stuff that I'm completely not doing. Um, so after, I didn't really have the resume that would put me in a in a position to, like, probably get one of those, you know, entertainment jobs. So um, I thought, you know, I just wanted to get incorporated transactional stuff. So I worked at this, like, fintech mortgage loan company as a staff attorney hmm. for about eight to nine months before I jumped over to Bloomberg. Got it. Um, so, Got yeah, at this time I wasn't even thinking about, you know, Producers, artists, lawyers. <laughs> I was just trying to get him, get get it, get some good legal. Experience. Yeah, yeah, just get some experience. Yeah. What what, what is, like is was there any any challenges in any of those in yeah. any of those jobs that you could like? You're like, okay, I really learned a lot here. There's, there was like some big challenges I had to tackle. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know anything about home home. You know, the mortgage lending. You mm-hmm. know, the uh, the the rules surrounding mortgage laws yeah. or homeowning laws, and and I mean, some of those laws are just very important for us to know as like human beings on right, earth like for sure you know i think later in my life they've definitely come into play just giving friends advice or you know trying to get my own place but um <clears throat> yeah i mean just learning the the i had no mortgage lending or um all those laws surrounding you real know estate funny yeah <laughs> oh I was a loan officer. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. I used to help with I used to help with licensing and stuff like that. Yeah, like for for you know that was that ran through the legal department, like licensing. I for couldn't the mortgage get loan no one to get a loan from me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't yeah. get no one for a whole year. It was tough, man. And it's also pe- most people aren't qualified, and you know yeah. it's like you try to sneak people through. Then on, underwriting probably just I was like, too nice. Yeah. I was too nice. You have to be like a sales asshole to be to be like be super aggressive to get a loan. Out. That's funny. Loan. Man. I couldn't yeah. do it. I was like, you know what? I can't make people get a loan and <laughs> go into go into debt. And I was like, I, I quit. I can't yeah. do it. When, when did you do that? Um, I was like 19 years old. I think. Wow. Probably like 19. Yeah. yeah, I was a kid. I was doing it. Um, yeah, I forget the name of the place I was at, but it was some, <laughs> it was some family owned and family owned law, law loan. Anyway, oh, yeah. beyond that, we're we're away. We're go, we're, <laughs> we're moving. Done. We moved yeah, up. We moved up, we moved up sure. from the loan business. Um, but how dope to be like named Bloomberg Law Forty Under Forty, and also like had had some experience there too, man. Yeah. Like that's a full circle moment. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I was, you know, at that time I was just crazy, man. I was just like, I remember I, I also got through school quickly. Like I was 21 when I graduated undergrad. 
Then I graduated law school. I think I was 23 or 24. So I was just super young. I was just, um, and I had that first experience. So I, I was probably like 24 and living in South Jersey. You know, um, the, the the one company I was talking about mm-hmm. was based in Philly. So I was like, I just can't do anything I want to do in this area. I need to go to New York. So I just moved. I quit that job. Didn't have Bloomberg lined up. Moved on my boy's couch. Um, and right in the Upper West Side, you know, which was a nice couch, right? It's Upper, it's upper <laughs> it's West Side. Couch. Yeah, it's a good couch, couch to be on. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I was just applying to jobs, and I got the Bloomberg gig, you know, yeah. doing, like, contract negotiations, mm-hmm. corporate law. Cool. And, um, and it was a great experience. I didn't leave on bad terms. They wanted me to, like, you know, extend my contract. It was, like, a very fruitful – and being, being in that building every day, I think that was probably the – the seed that made me feel like, all right, like you know, I, I, I like Bloomberg, but I kind of want to be Bloomberg. Yeah. You know, I think it's gonna be really tough for me to just, yeah. like, you know, I can get really comfortable inside this building. You know yeah. what's crazy? Um, Beat Stars spends, you know, corporations. We have to spend a lot of money on legal. You know, trademarks, defending our marks. Yeah. You know, corporate, corporate legal stuff. Yeah, corporate governance. Yeah. Yeah, like we spend. Probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, bro. Like sometimes I get I get those bills and I'm like, yeah. God damn. But at the end of the day, I feel like our legal team is protecting us and mm-hmm. they're taking care of us and they're looking out for us and they're and you don't you don't want to have that worry when you're an entrepreneur, you don't want to have that worry all the time. Like, oh, are we compliant? Right? Are we are yeah. we are we doing things the right way? Are we def- are we going after the things that are ours? You know what I mean? And um, so. Lawyers get a bad rap sometimes, man. It's a red category, though, right? Yeah. I talk about it green is. and it's red, red. Yep. you know, yep. things that help you, um, you know, help you earn more money. Those are the sexy, cool yep. people in the building. And mm-hmm. then there's like the the red category, the guys who aren't really helping you get money. Yeah. Um, and it, it could be. I, I think it is a tough analysis, though, for a lot of entrepreneurs. Like, yeah. Some I, a lot of people are just like, I don't, I don't care if we're not compliant. Like, you know, yeah. I think there's a bunch of companies who are, who just operate in that I don't space. Like that. Yeah, even artists and producers sometimes they'll just like be so disrespectful to yeah. their to their lawyer, right. and um, because they're costing them so much money. Right. And I'm like, yo, wrong way to think about it. Yeah, man. Wrong These, way to think that's insurance. That's that's your insurance policy. Those it people is. looking out for you, they, man. They are, and if you know. You don't want to go down that totem pole, or that list, or they stop answering your calls, and you know you don't. You, that's not what you want. Yeah, I got a whole. Because you're gonna need a lawyer. I yeah. got a whole different respect now right. for lawyers. For sure, <laughs> for sure. Right. Um, when did you first realize um, that this? Un- well, I think it kind of started out with this underserved online community of producers, sure. right? Yeah. When did you first? Were you, while you were working your nine to five, were you also kind of like hearing the horror stories, kind of like learning about the music? Because you said you always loved music, you wanted to be in entertainment, right. just didn't know where your niche was going to come from. Where were you going to? Where were you going to be your first penetration point? Yeah. So when? Who was that first producer or first situation? You're like, oh, these guys are. These guys are getting treated like shit. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, a lot, I, a lot of stuff's happening to these guys and girls. You know. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say two. I'll say three things. I'll say first, it was like I, I'm actually not a mu- music purist. I actually mm-hmm. never saw mm-hmm. myself working in the music industry. Mm-hmm. I wasn't like the plan. Mm-hmm. It was probably to kind of get some experience in entertainment, but like you know, be an entrepreneur, getting a product or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, second thing I'll say is I, I kind of left this out the story. A lot of my buddies in New York were like A and R's or. You know, a lot of people I was running with were, you know, they were signing artists. So I had, I was already one foot, you know, in that, like, hey, I'm a lawyer. You know, it was like, yo, my guy needs a lawyer. And I was always kind of like, nah, no, nah, you know, I don't really, that's not not my thing. I'm trying to climb this corporate ladder or yeah. whatever I was, yeah. you know, on at that time. It was a secure route. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, at some point it was just like, all right, like, you know, there's 5,000 lawyers for, uh, 5,000 5, artists and producers for, for every one lawyer. Like they're just under, they're just not being serviced. Too much. It's too many, and there's like you know, there was also there's like twenty attorneys that everyone cycles through, and mm-hmm. I'm just like, yeah, I mean, there's an opportunity and opportunity analysis I'm doing in my head that like, there's twenty probably lawyers that people go to, mm-hmm. like there's mm-hmm. space for another one. Not only is there space, like my practice would probably blossom very quickly, and mm-hmm. um, you know, mm-hmm. so, so I think that stuff started happening and. Yeah, the one of the first things I think that came across was like one of my boys just was like, "Hey, you know, I got a producer. You know, he needs a lawyer." Um, and then just just working with that producer and, and artist, um, I was like, "Man, this is crazy. How how are you even like eating? Like, you know, <laughs> like how are you get? How are you feeding? You know, yourself and you know anybody else around you?" And I think that just sparked it. Yeah. 
that's that, that's when I had that you know the realization for Beat Stars. It was like like you said, talking to these producers and hearing about how the how limited they were in making money, how many opportunity had lack of opportunities, and how they were getting jacked for these work for hire contracts. And $1,000, $500. I was dollars, like, yeah. you guys are professional? Yeah. I was like, this is what you call your profession? Yeah. It, you know, and it um, it didn't make sense to me, man. I'm so happy you saw you experienced that. Yeah, so I mean, as soon as I, <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. And, yeah. then, um, and then it just started happening, right? You just start, you know, putting out rhetoric or educational materials. Because um, I, I think that's first. Like, you know, most producers just, you have one conversation with them. You're just, you don't even know how you should be getting paid. Like, you don't even know no. that, you know, that should be in advance, you know, and on your future royalties. Yeah. You don't even know maybe what standard. Um, yeah. And if you're dealing with the independent artist, how can you collect your, you know, maybe, you, you know, you can collect your royalty still. Then there's the pub side. and So much. So I was like, first, let's like, you know, raise, raise the education, you know, because I think just people don't know enough. And you can't really collect or, um, you know, you don't, if you don't know what you're missing, then you don't, you, you're never going to get to that bag. Yeah. For sure, man. And for, like for years, you know, I've been doing this for 14 years, man. And and for years and with the advent of social media, you start hearing these horror stories. You start hearing like producers talking about, oh, I got robbed here. I got jacked here. I got taken advantage here. Um, and or, and actually and there's more cases where they're not talking about what happened to them because it's kind of embarrassing. So they don't a lot of a lot of producers don't talk about the the, the things they went through. Um, and and there's. And and so when I would meet them in person, I would hear about, you know, these kind of deals they would get themselves into. And then also just um, how they couldn't afford legal representation to go and get their copyrights that had been stolen from them. And um, and for a long time, lawyers in the music industry are have been so aligned and so dependent on the business from all of the major labels. They've been dependent, and so still, they still are. Still are yeah, a lot yeah. of them are, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so they couldn't really have an honest like conversation and representation for the copyright holders, and then they, especially for the producers, and so, so they would they would just like neglect their business. They wouldn't even like take them on. They wouldn't even care, you right. know. Um, and it bothered me, man. It really, really bothered me. And and then I saw you on Twitter. Probably is where kind of like yeah I think I think probably yeah. Twitter was where you kind of like stepped on to the scene, started giving advice, mm -hmm. and start educating, mm -hmm. and the comments and statements you were making were resonating with people and um, and they were genuine and I was like oh this guy's giving out some really good advice. why is this lawyer on Twitter dude right. like why <laughs> I was like why is this lawyer on Twitter why aren't all lawyers on Twitter right. you know what I'm saying. And um, it was my competitive edge. You, you talk about some sure. of these, these big law firms. I was yep. like, I'm not going to, my marketing is not going to be their marketing. Mm -hmm. I just quit and I just, you know, it's just not how I'm going to get the Lawyers clients. don't do marketing in the first place. They, don't do they just put a billboard. They, they put, put a billboard. Bill, yeah. billboard. In entertainment, it's like, you know, you don't even have a website half the time. Like some of these law firms that yeah. get all the business don't even, right. if you go to their website, it might be like a one pager. Right. Um, but, you know, so that, that, that also kind of struck me as people holding on to, the the uh, a model that just wasn't going to be future like i yeah. think the future of lawyers probably like we're going to get cut in half like you know mm -hmm. this isn't like a a lifelong in entertainment law i don't think so yeah right. yeah possible on the way out i think so i think so um yeah but you you kind of offset that with d different things that you're working on and then you're also scaling scaling with education and you're you're you know, you're doing you're doing different things and you're getting in at the right time where you when you need to get in on, at the right time you know right, right. which is why I, I would never feel threatened about saying the right thing or doing the right thing right Cause mm -hmm. like I don't you know I'm not I never thought of myself as a 30 year attorney it's a very taxing practice mm. it's very tough like you know if you're not ready for conf it's a com it's a um, contact sport I call it so it's a con yeah. sport of contact every single day you're um, you know, dealing with the aggressive email. Yeah. You get some crazy letters coming in. You got clients who are dealing with emergencies, right? So it's just like, you know, it's it's a it's a and, recipe and for sometimes, burnout. And yeah. sometimes you're dealing with giants too. It right. gets exhausting. Oh yeah. It oh, gets yeah. exhausting. You, you you feel, you know, threats I've had, you know, against me, you feel yeah. Like, oh shoot! Like man, you know, they don't like that this dude's independent. Yeah, He's they don't like. Actually... I'm trying to squash him. They're trying to you know bad mouth me to my clients. You know all sorts of stuff. Because everyone else has been in their pockets. Right. Yeah. 
And I'm like, I don't really. I'm Everyone not, else yeah. has been aligned yeah. with the with the message, with the deal, with the deal terms. Yeah. Everyone else got the. Everyone I don't got, live in Hollywood. Uh, I yo, live in Jersey, exactly. man. That's why I'm like, I don't, I don't know what they got going on. I, I, I I'm in Jersey, that, bro. Yeah. And that's why you're here. All right. Because I like I like talking to people that want to disrupt shit yeah. and um, you know bring humanity into their practice, man. Bring humanity into their practice. You know you, you know, um, and and it's so interesting because you're saying, oh, I got on Twitter, you know, I'm, and I'm like, there's where are the lawyers on Twitter? They're not there. But you're communicating with this generation of young creators that in the past, you know, prior to the advent of licensing online and and just online creative all, all content and all these in, pieces of intellectual property that are being created you know the the high value pieces of intellectual property in the past were not created by these young kids on the internet it, right. that was not happening yeah. that you know and so today you're seeing it done at scale and you're seeing it done at in crazy volume and you've seen these like producers um you know with some some of them you never even heard their fucking name have these like multi-platinum records and right. collaboration and you know has kind of like the barriers have been broken and so you you dove in um and waved a flag for these guys and girls and said yo i'm i'm here just letting y'all know right and you stepped out to be an entrepreneur yeah what well, well, i think out, i think it was like for me you know i think it was two things right for me it was creating um a sales funnel right because you know end of the day um for me to run my business and for me to even compete there's a bunch of producers who might not be ready for an attorney from a from a financial uh, perspective, um, but they had some needs, right? And their needs might be, um, you know, I don't know how to collect my publishing, um, so I don't know how to, like, what's a trademark versus a copyright. That's free game. That's information that you might be able to Google and it still might not make sense. I'm trying to help you understand that. You know, and, you know, in turn, you know, I'm creating a relationship with you. Um, I'm serving you, the community. I think if you're going to eat off a community or eat with the community, mm -hmm. like, you got to serve that community, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was my way of, like, hitting people I'm maybe I'll never work with, but also in the meantime, you know, I'll get you, I'll give you some game now that even by the time you even come to me or another attorney, your situation is not so screwed up that, you know, nobody wants to deal with it, right? So I, that's, that's kind of, that was my approach, yeah. Yeah, um, we live in this world of just like you know, hoarding information, hoarding hoarding experience, hoarding information, and we don't want to share it with people. And I think that's what sets you sets you apart, man. People thought you know, people looked at you like, honestly, like you look like them. Right. You're coming. You're coming from within the their community as well too. Right. And you know, and you're a music fan, and you're you know, you consider yourself a creative in the way your your business approach is, and so. You, you've, you know, you, you had a lot of great things going for you, man. I, I, one thing that, you know, you just don't see is you don't see a lot of African-American lawyers that are doing this kind of yeah, stuff successfully, you know, independently. Right. You don't see it. So um, first, I just want to applaud you Thank on you, repre man. representing your community yep, yep. and showing and showing other creatives and showing other people, you know, what's possible. Right. Um, and so. I, I love that. I Thank love that. You, nah, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man. Been talking to these producers for so long, and they're like, you know, they're always hitting us up for legal advice, and they're always hitting us up for like, can you help us do this? Help us do that. I'm like, man, we're not lawyers. You know, we're not lawyers. We can't help you with all this stuff. Um, we try as much as we can internally, but like you said, it's taxing. Yeah. Shout out to Kyle. Yeah, Kyle, man. Yeah, shout out to Kyle. Kyle, Kyle, help me uh, put some stuff together for you for this yeah. interview because he's, you know, he's he's good dude. He, what? Yeah, good Kyle dude. is an amazing, amazing guy and loves the community so much, and I think. Um, he aligns on your values. Nah, he's a good, yeah, good dude. Man. Yep. Yeah, you guys keep in touch a little bit? One. Yeah, y'all got a good one, yeah. Oh, love love yeah. Kyle. Yeah. Love him. Um, but, like, you're, you're, what you're doing, too, is, like, you're a marketer, man. Like, you're for real. Like, you're a marketer. Yeah. And, um, you know, lawyers are usually not marketers. Yeah. And you're approaching, you're approaching the game operationally and also from a marketing perspective like an artist. Like, you're, 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 you know, taking high quality photos. You're um, having conversations everywhere you can. You're right. you're getting on podcasts. You're being yourself. Um, you built this brand. You built this brand. You know, in a fairly quick amount of time, man. Right, right. In a fairly quick amount of time. For like, me, it felt like a long time, but for yeah. sure, for sure. Try <laughs> waiting the amount of years I waited until I paid myself my first check. Okay. No, I feel Stress, that. Stressful. No, I feel that. I feel that. Stressful. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, from outside looking in, 
for anyone to build any type of like successful business, you know, within a couple of years, man, it's like it's a blessing. Yeah. It's a blessing. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think? What do you think um, was the driving factor really behind all that? I mean, honestly, I think it was getting up to speed from a subject matter um, perspective. Like, you know, I think music law is tough, but it's not the toughest, right? I mean, they're like tribe patent law. Like, you know, having, you know, there's so many other uh, mergers and acquisitions, M and A. Like, there's some really brutal forms of law. Music law, you know, for everybody out there, you know, who might be watching this, who are, who's thinking about going to law school, um, like, it's, you know, that's something you could possibly, you could do that. You could learn the game fairly quickly. Um, and there's nuances that you'll keep learning over time, and maybe some of the you know older attorneys might school you, you know every now and then. Um, but so I was able to get my subject matter uh, expertise up quick, and then like the cost of the overhead, and you know, and it's kind of like producers now, right? What's the cost of making a beat and selling it, you know, everywhere internationally? It's like, you know, back in the day, it was really tough. Mm-hmm. Like you actually had to get in the studio, get your beats played, you know, develop that one-on-one relationship with the artist. Um, now you can send your you can you can download the demo of Fruity Loops, um, you know, make a beat, pull it off, sell it, and you know, upload it to Beat Stars. Some random artist, you know, pulls the beat from Beat Stars, and you know, all of a sudden you're in the game. So I think the just the cost of running a business in 2022, you know, no matter what industry it is, is it just it's just gotten so so much cheaper. Yeah, yeah. for sure, it's so much cheaper. God, I, w- I always tell people, man, I wish. We had these opportunities when I was younger, man. It was not there. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It wasn't there. You know, everybody. You know, I, I, you know, it, it's just so true. This, this, and this, this is a definitely a golden age, and you know, I guess in, in technology and entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yes, everyone could be an entrepreneur, man. It's amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Um, you're big on education. You said you're, you know, you you teach. Right. You're a professor. Right. Right. Um, and you're always providing educational tools and content on your website, right. and you know, for for the for the community. Um, I know you said it's part of your marketing tactic. I know it's part of your inbound marketing, but at the same time, is there an, is there another like you know yeah. genuine reason why you you want to do you want to do those kind of things? <laughs> and the reason why I even say that because yeah. you know I hate when people lie and say it was all for like justice and yeah, it, look for sure I get it. Like I think eighty percent of it, you know, for me was just like oh, um, there are people who just. And it's not going to affect my bottom line. Who just don't know this information, and I can give it to them. Yeah. Right. I think that's yeah. a large part of it. I think the twenty percent was probably creating that market marketing channel. But mm-hmm. the other part was like really just, I, again, you know, I think about community building. You know, um, you know, building a community without compromise. You can't build community without serving that community. Yeah. Like you can't have people. If I drop a book tomorrow, who's going to buy it? If I'm not really servicing that community. Mm-hmm. So I think for every, that's mm-hmm. like everybody who's if you're a producer out there and your 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 brand is all about you and you're not giving game to other producers or you're not putting out tutorials or you're not helping people, you're probably your 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 community is probably going to be limited, right? You might have some fans who just like your beat quality and you might be that upper echelon of just like, you know, a uh, hit maker, but if you're the average producer who is coming up and you know you got some placements and you're building your community, it's going to be hard to build that community without giving back to that community. Mm-hmm. So I, I just think services is, is is the the driving force of building any community. For sure, for yeah. sure, and and I, I think like going through legal legal school and interning and going becoming a lawyer and working your way in. And isn't there kind of like a culture of like doing pro bono work for people? There's like a cult- we have to, yeah, we yeah, have to, like, to keep cult- our bar, yeah, yeah. There's a culture of giving back. You have to. It's like it's incorporated into your practice, right? Yeah, I, ha- I have to do a certain amount of pro pro bono. Um, in Jersey, sadly enough, um, like they put me on like criminal cases, which you know, that's that it's now it's exposing me to like a whole other group of problems that I'm like, you know, actually, just when you I got comfortable. Like, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I'm like, oh shoot, you know, maybe I'll be able to help, you know, on, on this yeah. side of the world. Yeah. That's cool. It keeps you kind of accountable. Yeah. Keeps your work accountable, man. Um this one's from Kyle. Shout out to Kyle. He was he was asking what are what are your thoughts on um catalog sales in, in today's today's world of like all these producers and artists selling selling their copyrights. I I I, I don't mind it. I think what I guess bothers me is, you know, any company that could sell for a hundred million dollars, right? I mean, you think about that valuation, you think about a beat stars value, you Mm -hmm. know, valuation Mm -hmm. when you're trying to raise money. Mm -hmm. It's like you have a staff, you have an employees working that I think like, you know, 
I'm, I, Justin Timberlake's catalog, for example, I'm, I think that sold for a little bit over $100 million. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, if Justin had, and he might have a team, so, but, you know, and this is all rhetorical, but, like, if Justin had, if he hired a, mar- like a you know, a marketing guru um, and had people servicing his likeness and all that other stuff, like, is it $100 million? It probably could be, like, a $500 million company, right? Because you're, you you're building a real ecosystem to it. So I think sometimes I feel like, you know, you're, you're I think, it it just it should show the next generation of creators that when you own something and you can put a valuation on something, you are actually a company and you can actually operate as such and you'll probably in turn create you know create more value for that company instead of just selling it for um whatever that the cuz like you know some of these catalogs you're seeing is like they just sold out, sold and there was really no structure or organization there was no they had nobody on their team trying to drive you know new sales funnels mm-hmm new opportunities you know maybe they had an agent probably working the new stuff but you talk about think about that so it, it's just funny it's i, yeah. I think um yeah. it, it should show the next batch of creators that um you know this is this is really you're, you're building companies and um the the bread's there if you do it the right way yeah mm. yeah and I wonder if it's like from an investment standpoint are these guys acquiring catalog just for the pure appreciation and increase of valuation year over year or like you said, they're uncovering all these other licensing opportunities, these other things that's happening in the world today. New media, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think uh, I saw like, you know, when the, the labels do their sort of end of the year, you know, profit, you know, their statements because they're, some of them are public. Um, you know, you're looking at where the mm-hmm. revenue is coming from sometimes. And, you know, each year new media is getting bigger. New you know, media. Roblox. Yeah. Um, TikTok, mm-hmm. all that good stuff. You know, it's just that category is just getting bigger and bigger. Um, so I, I think that's a factor, but I also think that when you think about the publishing ecosystem in particular, I mean, you just saw, um, you know, the copyright office, you know, um, deny that appeal and approve the 15% increase for mechanical licenses, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so now mechanical royalties are growing up. So the publishing is making a little bit more. I honestly think that number is going to jump a little bit more. I also think that songwriters and producers, um, well, they're not. They, they, while it's never going to be even, they're going to get a little bit closer. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I think there's some value that's going to happen from songwriter and producer advocacy that also make those publishing catalogs um, a little bit more valuable. And it's happening. Yeah, I see that. You yeah. know, for the first time, right? For yeah. the first time, kind of like you know, people are actually going to Washington, and you know, pushing for these for these changes. You know what I right. mean? Um, uh, you think about you think about the, I, I I think about. This is something that I'm just looking at, and I think it's it's not going to stay this way. I think you know when when a dollar revenue is generated from Spotify, I think 57 cents roughly goes to the master holder, mm-hmm. like 30 stays with um, Spotify, and only 13 percent goes to publishers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's really low. That just feels I feel it just doesn't pass the eye test, right? I think yeah. you know naturally there's there's opportunity, and I think that's going to like Spotify should never get paid more than a song. It, they're a, they're a service provider. Like how are Spotify getting paid more than like you know than the publishers and the songwriters? It doesn't make sense, right? So I I think there's gonna be some opportunity for blatant things that don't make sense to to kind of kind of make those publishing catalogs a little bit more val- valuable in the next ten years. I'm just sitting here smiling, admiring yeah. those words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting here smiling, admiring those words because, yeah. And and that's I guess that's why you kind of always see the pushback from people like Spotify and how, you know, they're now they're creating this kind of like uh, they're creating an enemy now with the songwriters and producers, even in the press. And they're and blatantly saying, you know, they, they want to actually decrease. Yeah. They want to decrease. their. Yeah, they don't want the, to the, the mechanicals. They want it to stay. They're like, oh, no, you yeah. know, it's expensive to run it. And, and their and their thought process, you know, it's expensive to run this company and we provided value. We saved you guys from. Sure. That era in time where you remember the gap where, you know, everything was getting pirated and, you yeah. know, record sales weren't happening, physicals weren't selling. And but no, this was just a this is just what was going to happen. Like, digi- we were eventually the music industry was going to digitize. Like, yeah. you're not the savior. Yes. Yes. Let's <laughs> let's let's um, let's 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 forecast a little bit then. Like there's going to be this, this friction that, that exists. Right. Rights holders are continuously pushing and moving, and now there's bigger, bigger money 
um, that have interest in these in these rights now, these huge investors, these huge banks. You, you're talking like some of the biggest private equity firms in the world now right. are acquiring copyrights now. Mm -hmm. They've never have. They've never done this shit before. And so, you know, you know what their goal is. So um, what do you think is going to change? What do you think is going to like what do you think is going to change in the landscape of it? Are these all you can eat streaming cons consumption services? Are they going to have to pivot their business models? Which it looks like they are already. I mean, right? They're mm -hmm. already like acquiring podcasts. What? It's all podcasts on Spotify now. <laughs> you know, yeah. they work directly with the creator on with with the podcast. I don't have to worry about yeah. you know the labels and the and the rights holders. And they, they, and they can just, dictate the terms. They whatever just they work want. for hire it, and they just con contact uh, all the content just lives on their. They platform. loving that yeah. shit. They, love they, lo that. they yeah. loving that shit. And what's going to end up happening is um, music. Music will go down in the priority list. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're trying to because it's expensive. Paying royalties out for Spotify is really, really expensive. It cuts at their bottom. That's the biggest. That's the only thing really cutting out their bottom line. So they're like, "Oh, we'll acquire these podcasts and all that stuff." Because I don't. I'll pay for that one time. I pay one time for that content, but you know, I, I don't owe you a royalty. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Let's let's. Okay, we're going. Let's let's go deeper into the whole royalty thing. Now you got. Um, I got a phone call. From, I guess I think it was a CEO of SoundCloud at one point a few years ago, and and his and his um, business development team, and they had pitched me this this new, they wanted my you know because we were we're a SoundCloud partner label, one of the earliest ones, and um, they had pitched us this new um, royalty structure where it was not based on it was not based on like the market share so it was like if i pay if i pay ten dollars a month for the music service and i listen to just tupac tupac is going to get all my money not not shared with the rest of the you know the the whole market share scheme that's that's happening on spotify right um i i like i got on that call and i was like yes yeah. fuck yes Makes thank sense. you Makes please sense. thank yeah. you thank you thank you i was like do this you're you're doing us a favor you know and i really like pushed and encouraged them to do that and um i was happy that they actually like went through with it too after yeah. after those conversations um and soundcloud has kind of been um a service that's you know had its really hot peak moment in terms of like music discovery and BeatStars was a big part of that with the A boogies and the with with the hoodies boogie, and we you know yeah, 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 yeah we were doing you know we were doing um his SoundCloud monetization same nice. thing same thing with Lil Pump in the early days when you know they were just young artists buying beats on BeatStars putting up putting up, putting up stuff on SoundCloud and um and I saw the revenue you know I saw their their revenue potential and I was like man that's that's awesome like there's some there's some cool independent revenue potential here for independent artists on SoundCloud um what do you what are your thoughts on this new new shift in their in their payment model I think it's I think it's definitely a good start I mean you know I think when you think about Spotify and the way it even happened and you know it was just it was we we embraced this new age backwards, right? Like Spotify had to beg, like you know, the labels and then all these other people to get on, right? That they had to beg. It wasn't like an easy transition. It yeah. was like, what is this weird company? And then you know, obviously yeah. they they brought some of the right stakeholders in, and um, and you know, Troy Carter's of the universe who kind of helped. Yep. Maybe bridge the gap with the labels, so because there was already a million streaming services before them, it, it was, was already, already it was already happening. It was already happening, right? Yeah. So um, the royalty model, they didn't build this royalty model to sort of help the create, like you know the the be transparent. I think it kind of just each year it's been you know it probably took shape in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So I, I think out of all things, they that that was probably the least thing that they were intentional about. And I think that's clear, right? Like I think this mm -hmm. the pooling method of you know royalties and you know I there's a guy that I'm named Jeff Price. And I'll shot Jeff uh, out. He he spoke to my class. Um, That's the founder of TuneCore. Uh, yeah, yeah. Back in the day. Yeah, right? yeah. He, yeah. Jeff Rice is the founder of TuneCore, and now he just founded um, uh, uh, Spoken Giant, I think it is, and it's the company that is fighting now for comedy royalties to be paid out. Mm. So this guy is just like a. He is an app. He is an advocate, and he is an information giver, and he is he just doesn't give a fuck. He doesn't care. So Jeff Price posted a um, the definitive guide to Spotify royalties. It's free. It's up there right now. It's like a tw and I, I put it. I give it to all my college students. Yeah. It goes through how and wow. basically you leave by saying, oh, they're just like they're making this stuff up. 
Like this, this yeah. isn't like there was like a, they're accounting. You know, but the, I, I feel this way about labels too. But like I know they're. I'm like there is no account. Proceed. You just made this formula up. This is like not backed by anything. This is crazy. No so, models. No <laughs> models. It's like it's it's like yo. How could it just doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. And then you think about the stakeholders involved, and you, you're like, okay. Like, you know, Yo, people may yeah. hold on. Let's stop yeah, real quick because people might start thinking, oh, why is Abe and Carl complaining? Right. Why are they complaining so much? No, <laughs> it's not. We're not. Com- we're not complaining. We care about artists. Yeah. We care about like this is where they make their livelihood. If they can, right. if they even could get a shot at making a livelihood. Right. But what if the trash man on your street didn't come today? Wouldn't you complain? Or like or they were very efficient. They were dropping trash on the street like in your in your neighborhood. This is your this if you're a producer, you're an artist, you're anybody listening. It's like why wouldn't you care? Got to care. You got to care. That's like life. That's just, you have yeah. to care. You got to care who's 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 um who's taking care of your babies. Yeah. You got you're giving your you're giving your babies to these people. Man, <laughs> you're right. Like, you know what I'm saying? And you're trying to eat. You're trying to like yeah. cr- this is your way of eating. Yeah. You should be as involved in these conversations hmm. or as ticked off or as you know, excited as I am. Like, yeah. I'm not even a producer. I'm not an, yeah. even an artist. Yeah. And it's good that I'm, but it has to, you know, a lot of these movements have to be inspired in, you know, there, there needs to be more songwriters and producers yeah. and artists who are willing to band together. I yeah. think the fact yeah. that there's no players union or, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I know there's been conversations about, you know, yeah. producer union or, right. um, the, the fact there's no organizing body, is I think is telltale, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I, it just... Not saying it would fix everything, um, but it would definitely help get you know the community a little bit more aligned in some of the the the, the pain points that I think you know a lot of people are seeing. Yeah, yeah. And B Stars could help be a part of that and kick that off. You have to be a part of it. You 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 have you have to be a part of it because you know. Yeah, I mean that's dude. That's the exact like, you know what we're still fighting about. Um, and it all can be solved with innovation. Just someone caring for a little bit, just sitting back and saying, "Okay, let's let's wipe the slate clean. Yeah. Let's wipe the whiteboard. Let's let's wipe it clean. Let's start from scratch. Let's start from scratch." Right? Um, they have the power to do that. Yeah. And and I think you know when Beat Stars, you know when we first came out in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, you know, um, yeah, we were frowned upon. You know, we were frowned upon. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, like, there, there was some producers, like, <laughs> they were like, no. What, yeah. do you, what do you mean you're going to sell a beat for $25? Right. What do you mean you're going to sell a beat for $50, right? Um, you're devaluing our craft. You know, they're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, I got, I got, man. I remember. Yeah. Motherfuckers were like, I was. I had to hear a lot of shit. <laughs> I had to hear a lot of shit. And, I, and, and a lot of it was like behind my back, too. And, and I just, I just wish a lot of motherfuckers would just call me. Yeah. Let me explain to you what we're trying to do, dog. Right. Let me just kind of, can I just like, can I just give you my elevator pitch? Can I just tell you what we're trying to do? There's a bigger cause here. Yeah. We're taking back power. Mm-hmm. Can you, can you, can you just let me innovate? <laughs> like, can I help? Yeah, you know you what I mean? Like, and, yeah. and, and it's okay. Like, I understood, I understood that, you know, with everything that changes, um, with everything that changes, there's always going to be resistance, and 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 I know that you know people people are operating in their little silos, and you know you know they 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 they're making it's like that real selfish mentality, like oh I'm making money, I'm making I'm good, I don't what I'm getting twenty. It's like you're not even yeah, part yeah. of this community. I'm getting twenty thousand to be you know I'm you know I'm, it's like yeah. you're not even a producer. Yeah, it's like you you know when you said like we should care about all these things, like right. we should care about you know. How our how our music is monetized? How our, like it, it got to a point where the egos and the producers in the game didn't even associate themselves with their community of creators. Like they didn't even fucking exist and even think about them. You, I mean, it still happens. I mean, I still, still look at people still. who are looking at everything that comes out of their mouth as like a a weird thing about the community, a producer community or something like. And I'm yeah. like, come on, this isn't helping. Like, yeah, <laughs> this man. isn't helping. Yeah, man. And we still there's always a lot of there's always infighting and there's always you know. Yeah theft and there's people you know it's gonna happen it's right. gonna happen but you know what i'm 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 a, i'm glad i didn't i didn't let none of that shit stop stop us from from going and moving yeah i agree I think, man i mean i think a testimony I, and i've always told you this is like you know a, a producer having a three thousand or four thousand more in their pocket you know per month 
allows them to make a little bit better decision about, you know, the agreements that are coming in. We don't got look, you don't gotta sell this beat for five hundred dollars and and just give it to some artists. Like you don't have, like you just made ten thousand dollars on that beat. Like why don't you keep it up? And they can have ex- you know, non exclusively um, um, but so, so it, 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 the taking the power, so much of this is just like a, you know, I, I, it's a financial conversation too. It's part of taking the power back. You know, that I see it as like, you know, you can make better decisions when you have more money in your pocket. That's just a reality. hundred yeah. percent. When you're broke, you're saying yes to anything. everything, yeah. anything, you know, um, that's a whole different, you know, yeah. playing field that you're on when you don't need the money. Yeah. I mean, I've seen producers on Stars turn down. 25k 30 30k yeah. for a beat i've seen producers turn down 50k yeah so like you know, you know why because that producer is making 50k a year what? just off that one beat on <laughs> yeah. Star. Yeah. so they're like doesn't make sense this is yeah. a product of my catalog it's going to be continually making me passive income recurring income why would i want to remove products from my catalog yeah and um and i also think that should yeah. be that's not that create. If you're a label and you're offering a thousand dollars, and your pitch is because a lot of it's like, wait, there's a batch of artists where I think most producers would objectively just be like, okay, like this producer wanted if the artist wanted it for a thousand dollars, I'm gonna get my return on the back end thirty times over. A lot mm-hmm. of the yeah. artists and moments that they're selling, they're telling these kids to take their beats up, down for are for. You know, just it just like it does the cost, you know, opportunity cost benefit analysis doesn't make sense. So, you know, I I always say like, you know, um, and then like you think about major, yo, it's almost even better to sell your beat to an independent artist who's doing okay, because yeah, because like you you you, at least on via distro kid you can just get you know get your distro kid money and you know directly and you'll get your royalties exactly. You know, as opposed to like you know you give that to a label, you know, you might see you'll never see your points. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. man. So, exactly. I I think you know the collaboration piece, even sharing on the master side, that's got to happen more frequently and at yeah. a higher percentage, probably. You know, especially if it's like you're investing in a low cost production. You know, low cost production, because um, that's what's happening now with with the labels. They're they're produ- the, some of the producers are not willing to sell the exclusive, so they're being forced to license that production from the producers non exclusively right. for major projects. Yeah. And so and then during you know, and then, you know, there's there's some listen, we've made a lot of progress. There's a lot of progress happening compared to what it used to be. <laughs> you know, you I mean compared to what it used to be. Like there like I remember I remember um publishing deals from some of the some of the major publishers. And listen, nothing against them, man. Listen, we're just talking facts. I remember some of the major publishers were signing some of our producers. Trying to get some of that money, right? Well, they were restricting them from selling online no yeah, more. Yeah, they were, yeah, yeah. I, I, they, you know, they're like, hey, uh, if we're gonna, you're gonna sign this, like, I remember those. Co- I remember that. Vividly. Yeah, that used to happen. To, every producer I was on, like, that's just not, <laughs> that's just not gonna happen. But right, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So there was a moment where producers had to give up their ability of self determination, give yeah. up their ability to build their own businesses, and just so they can have those opportunities, you know. Um, but. Yeah, I've had, I had, labels, I've had pub companies shifted. say, I want, you know, I want a piece of that. You don't got to stop. Yeah. But, I you know, I, I just want a piece of that, too. <laughs> yes. Yep. They, that's happening. Yeah. But, um, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing the, the, the um, compromise happen more often now. And I'm, I'm seeing that people are understanding that these young people are building businesses and they've already built it before we even got into the picture. And we have to continue allowing them to do that. And so these, these terms are being carved out of their publishing agreements, and it's and, awesome, bro. And the so facts, good. and the, the facts are that when we're talking about publishing, and when someone sells their beat on Beat Stars, you know, is you, it's more equivalent to an advance or you know for the master. And usually, some of these songs are still getting registered, and you know, on the PROs, and the pub companies are still getting their their cut because the songs are getting registered, right? Yeah. It's like you would, you can't, you're not even. A lot of my argument is like you just—that's not even your fight. Like you, you, yeah. you have—you don't even have rights to, to that side of the coin. You, you don't get none of the producer advances. You don't get any of the producer fees. Why yeah. would you? Why would you uh, think that you're gonna? I get, gotta ask you a yeah. question. I'm um, just curious your your take on it because you know I don't. Sometimes I don't know what the outside perception is of stuff. You know, Beat Stars. You know, we did our partnership with Sony Music Publishing, yeah. right? And for the first time, um, a major publisher. Um, tapped into an online community, community technologically 
and was able to start, you know, um, administering songs and registering, res- registering, registering songs at scale for the first time in history. It's never been done. I don't, I don't know of any major that's tapped into any technology platform that's creating songs or, or you know, I think it's the first time it's been done. Right. But the, 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 you know, previously in the past, the business model has never been, especially at the major publishers, has never been kind of like, let's sign everything, let's register everything, let's put everything through the system. That that wasn't a thing, you know? Right. And it was very, they were very strategic about who they worked with and who they signed, who had admin deals and, um, what are you, what are your what are your thoughts on what we did there, man? I'm just like sometimes I like because you're you know you're an entertainment lawyer you, you, you deal with cr- creators and I'm just like from the outside and you're an industry you're an industry kind of like expert you know what's going on you're reading into everything like what what were your what were your thoughts on like us opening the door for for that to happen? Yeah, I, th- I thought it was a good thing and I think you hit on I think you hit on something that I think really hasn't been done which is kind of the tech piece and like. You know, a lot of these large scale pub companies should be embracing the thought of embrace like, you know, registering all songs Mm -hmm. and being a part of like, you know, all songs should be registered. I don't don't think I don't like I don't know if that's my tagline, but, you know, I, I, I genuinely believe all songs should be registered. So how we get there, it has to be a collaborative, you know, and the people who have the tech, the people who are, you know, that's that's the big that's the important. They have the. The, the powers that be, as much as that, you know, as much as I might hate them um, or not don't, you know, but as much as I might have friction with them, um, they are always and usually in the best position from a data, from a monetary, from every other perspective to take that risk to like in to, to help the rest of the community. So I thought it was a good that was a good partnership. And it definitely moves us toward that goal of, of getting getting so all songs registered. Yeah. Okay, Carl proves. Thank yeah. God. <laughs> um, all right, let's get into some uh, some of the stuff that you're working on, man. You okay? There's this. You were working with Blast, yeah. and I I follow you. I've been following you on social media for a long time, yeah. and I discovered him through you. Oh, that's awesome! Come Yo, on. I discovered, Blast. Come on, man. I discovered him through you. He was not really like he didn't really have that many fans yet when you first started working with him. Yeah. Like, what made you um, what made you like? be a fan and like want to work with him early on so or so early like what what was happening in his career that you're like I want to work with this dude uh, for me it was it was instant I remember you know in my relation everyone's always like you know I was a Jersey dude you know business partners and started a label and you know co-found a label with a the dude from LA and I heard the music one day and this was early in my in my entrepreneurship journey I'm talking about like one of the days I left Bloomberg you know I'm talking about, like it was in those days it was early and I left Bloomberg, and you know I just was going release radar on Spotify, and the song just popped up. Damn! And then I just looked at, you know, I just I just went through a rabbit hole, and a, and I was like, this guy is intentional. The art, you know, from the graphics to, and it kind of it kind of spoke to me just on large. I was like, yo, you don't even have to have that much money to put put out in a, a consistent brand. And he was just doing it, and I just I was just like, this guy just needs a little help. Like, some people just need a little help. Like, you know, I think a lot of executives, like, toot their horn about what they've done for artists, and it's always about them and articles, but it's like, nah, somebody like Blash just needed just a little bit of help. He needed some mm-hmm. operational help. He needed someone that was going to help him enhance some of the stuff he was doing. Um, and, you know, he, he found his manager first, Vic, who's, you know, um, we own Eagle together, me, Blast, and Vic. Um, he found Vic first, and, you know, they always talk about it. They thought they were going to meet an old white guy. Well, Vic thought he was because Blast didn't tell him, you know, I was a young black kid. Um, so I fly out to L.A. like literally. Who's like, this lawyer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Vic's man, you know, he's kind of like, yo, I don't know. I thought this dude was about to come in like a suit, old white dude. And, um, you know, I flew out to L.A. probably a week after I heard that, that the song. Just on some, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't doing that was like those are those are that was working capital dollars I needed. Mm. That <laughs> so I flew out, you know, no no guarantee. And from that day, we just sort of you know locked in from a you know from an energy perspective, but also just the things that we want to do in and outside the industry because the music business is just a vehicle. I think you know you think about impact, um, and each year you start getting more visible or aware of some of the things going on in your community in the world. Yeah. that it's just so like you know. From a foundation aspect to a tech and VC aspect, you know, we were just all aligned about like, yo, we're starting here, but we're going to use our platforms and do other stuff. Yeah. 
Yo, how dope was, I mean, he's still kind of, is he still independent? Yeah. Yeah, and, everyone, and, look, so everyone else calls him independent. Like, I don't, I don't know, you know, we, we are a privately owned company, and mm-hmm. obviously any deal we do, you know, Blast, you know, owns his, his masters, yeah. owns his publishing, yeah. even on the, on, the, on the, that's just, you know, that's just what it is, yeah. but um, you need partners, you need yeah, vendors, course, you need people to, to, you know, you need money, you need yeah, scaling for dollars. For sure, for sure. Um, so um, we partner with Red Bull, and, you know, mm-hmm. a company like Red Bull, that's why I say, like, people put us in the independent bucket, but it's Red Bull. Like they have a lot of resources. Yeah, a lot. So I mean, if, if we're independent, I, I don't know. I, I you know, in the traditional, yeah, like, it's a partnership. It's a partnership. But I, I, it's hard for me to with that in the traditional music industry model. Sure, we're independent. We didn't sign with one of the majors. Mm-hmm. But from a business perspective, it's major. Do I think that we're independent? No, I, I don't think so. Yeah. I think we have a massive funding partners. You know, operating at the same level. Operating at the same level. Mm-hmm. You know. You know. I saw the when we when we um you know we've always done very transparent deals. We did like a shorter term deal for No Love Lost, and that record just went crazy. You know, Chosen's on No Love Lost, all that other stuff. But we were out, so we had the ability to go sign, and we and I think it's a telltale sign mm-hmm. that we that we repartner with, with Red Bull. Yeah. You like those short term deals. It's a, we, we we call it the LeBron method. Like mm-hmm. you know, yep. LeBron always does like you know a one year or in a yeah. player option. Options. Yeah, <laughs> one one year, and then like I'll do a player option. I think if you have that leverage to do that, then it behoove you probably to do one year with with a player option. Yeah. Especially if you feel like your operation's tight and yeah. it's working well, and you you know you're confident in your ability yeah. to to make mu- make great music too. Yeah, you know? I mean, and then and then, and then you know, and then yeah. just getting on Kendrick's al- album randomly. With- <laughs> You know, for for context too. I mean, we have we have ten full time employees, right? Health healthcare. We have an office in L.A. Yeah. Um. You know, we've invested in a bunch of companies. We're gonna invest in a bunch more. Um. It's like it's. I I just want to show people the power of operation. Like, there's been a lot of moguls. There's been a lot of other stuff. There haven't been a lot of operators that have come from hip hop, and I, I think I view myself that way. Yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot of operators. Yeah, there's not a lot, a lot of operators. Um, I mean, I would, call, I would call myself an operator. I think so. I would call myself. Clear, an operator. Yeah, I was gonna say, clear. but <laughs> you are. But um, I'm trying to like get away from operations a little bit, you know. And when you talk about your team, you're like, oh, I got ten. We got ten people. Um, you know, Beat Stars, you know, for a long time didn't really have. I was like the sole executive, you know, from from an executive standpoint, the only, you know, and uh, we're going through a moment now where we're hiring leadership, we're hiring, you know, amazing talent operationally, like, you know, product, you know, now, uh, y'all have marketing. A lot of people, we're, man. No, no, we're starting to, you know, we're starting to. <laughs> I get emails from people from BeatStars. I'm like, who is this dude? I, like, <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's good. But um, you can't win without a team, man. Yeah. That's just not possible. Yeah. It's not possible. You can't replicate yourself a million times, right? Right. And and um, you. It seems that you kind of, um, any the first moment you're able to like start adding more people to the team. Yeah. How were you intentional about that? Adding like how careful were you? How careful were you? Like you know picking and choosing who who's on your team and yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and you know I'll give Vic this credit. I mean Vic Vic's put his you know whole. Bless sweat and tears and the ego and you know that's why he's the president and um and and i think you know vic's been very he know he's a very putting people in i'm i'm not that good at it mm. actually that part mm. of the game yeah me too I suck i'm at not that. i'm not good at and you know so so you so, got hr you got yeah. head of hr which is which is vic, vic <laughs> yeah, he's is head a president of slash head of hr, <laughs> head of HR. Slash, you know okay. um so you know vic, vic's a you know he's that type of person but i think the next level for us as a company though is um, you know, building, you know, a, a little bit more of a global and a an operation that, you know, really gets the best people and not not to say that none of our people aren't the best. You know, yeah, we always I, I, I genuinely would call them the best, but you know, we we wanna be able to hire <laughs> The young Harvard, you know, grad who just graduated. He wants to work in, mm-hmm. in culture and you know, build. We want to be, we want to be competitive. We want the top talent, right? So I think that's just to to get the top talent, though. You know, you're you have to have you know the proper infrastructure and yep. and Brand all that good stuff. Too. Brand recognition, all that. 
Yeah. So there's a yeah. lot that goes into it, man. Yeah. Good luck. That's why a lot of people do these. You know, I, good you luck know, on I, that journey, man. I, I love. I you know. I think there's a lot of you know money raisers and you know these press releases and you know I get it I get it like mm-hmm. you need to scale your operation you need the fun but it also creates some momentum. So what was um what was y'all's reaction when when the the Kendrick opportunity happened though? Yeah, it was it was it was obviously how did it happen? Um, yeah, I think I think um, and Blast has spoken about this you know mm-hmm. on record. Yeah. Um, I think uh, so basically just Kendrick reached out. Um, said he he wanted to share some ideas and um, and it just you know his ideas were shared and the song came out. And, Sick um, man, you know it's one of my favorite tracks on the album. Yeah, and so good. Kendrick's a goat man. I mean he's really, you know even the next level you see him with PG Lang and everything he's building. You're like mm-hmm. oh I could I I see he's going in a direction that is about to be meteoric. Stock price yeah. go up when that ha- after that happened, you feel like you feel like, like I feel like w- it did. I, yeah. But you know what's funny? I mean, I don't I don't know. Yeah, it, it I think we just it's we we kind of just do the 2x to 5x thing. Like each year, you know, we want the with that level of growth and I think internally we all kind of speak that way. So maybe maybe if it did externally, I don't think we felt it internally. Yeah. yeah. That's cool, man. That's cool. Um Independent artistry, yeah. um, relying just on the traditional ways of monetizing music is is tough. You have Super to. Super tough. Yeah, you gotta you yeah. gotta you gotta do partnerships elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, you're building a team. How 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 important are you know adding in all of these other partnerships to help to help kind of um, the brand grow? It's that it's it's what you have. You just hit it on the nail. I think there's only a few artists. Um, and you know, I shout out to Brent and Brent Fires and his team. I mean, you know, I think they're one of the few people who are completely, and I, you know, I, they're actually getting paid from their music and getting paid a lot. I think he did like a hundred first week. So if you're an independent and you make, you, know, you sell a hundred, you know, hundred thousand copies first week, yeah, that that's when it starts being. <laughs> that's like that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, but for the most people, even if you are, you do have gold records, you do have platinum records, and your stuff streaming consistently, it, it can it can add up. Maybe, maybe you're doing you know fifty thousand a day, or and you know all that stuff starts adding up. Um. But yeah, to, to scale, like to to build a large scale operation, you're gonna need some. You're gonna need some. Uh. You know, a large um inflection of cash. You also need to. Um, build more valuable IP, um, create more brand uh, equity and awareness. So, you know, I always talk about, even with producers, I'm like, you know, the the worst thing that was told to you guys was to be 100% behind the scenes. Yeah, and, man. Yeah, worst thing. I don't know yeah, who started that narrative. Yeah. <laughs> brainwashed. That is, that, is just, that, is the, that is bad advice. Stupid. Stupid advice. Man. Why? Yeah. It didn't used to be like that. I feel like it didn't used to be that way. Nah, man. Yeah. I don't know who brand. I think you know, I'll be honest with you. I think it was uh, the schools, the music schools, and, and I'm sorry, but the music making schools, the production schools. I think they um, they always push this like behind the scenes producer narrative at mm-hmm. the school. You're the behind the scenes engineer. You're behind the scenes production. You're the guy in the studio. You're not a you're not a brand. You're not an entrepreneur. And you know it's crazy. They're still teaching them that shit. Yeah. Yeah, they're st- I know. <laughs> they're still teaching them that shit at the schools, yeah. and they're not teaching them to build, build, build their own brands. Yeah. And because um, it hurts the negotiation, it's like you know, if you, all you're contributing to. Because I rep artists too, right? So I don't mm-hmm. just rep, you know, repping a balance of artists and producers. It's like it hurts the negotiation when if you're a producer, you can't say you're adding anything, any other value to that song other than I just produced, you know, a beat, right? Like, which is super important. Producing a beat is super important, but there's a marketing. Um, need there's a promo need there is you know this guy's out here performing the song all over the globe you know there's a radio push there's dollars being spent to to make that record that ip valuable right and you really don't play a part in making that ip valuable yeah you could and there's people who do and there's people who sort of and, and that also gives you way more leverage at the time of you know the, the producer agreement comes in if you want if you deserve that feature credit or you know, you want to be on the cover art. You know, all that stuff plays a factor. You yeah. know who's, like, I'm the biggest fan of right now in terms of, like, building a producer brand and, um, you know, is Hit Boy. Yeah, he goes he goes crazy, man. Yeah. That guy just, like, and it's crazy. And it's, um, his approach is like an artist. And the artist he works with just 
boast about him and how great he is too. It's like it's it's a two way it's a two way street, and they're you know and they talk about him as this. They have this this that type of respect of him as like a featured artist collaborator. For sure. And um, he's building his brand so well, um, and he's becoming a household name. He already is. I mean, yeah. but but even more know, so. He's even becoming, more so. He's yeah. still because producers are always kind of still having because they 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 they're, they get hot on a project right. and then. That what's the they they got to jump to the next project yeah. on 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 who else to choose and I love how he is kind of building a pipeline of projects. I think what I love yeah that's what I love about him most. I guarantee you, ask Hitboy right now, he'll probably tell you I've got my next twenty four months, thirty six months. Yeah, planned dude's the crazy, fuck man. Out. Yeah, like I'm just his his the work product that comes out of. The, I, people who operate like that, I'm always like, man, that that's like I think yeah, I think Kanye is like that too, like where it's just like for how are you getting so much out? Mm-hmm. Like, and mm-hmm. not, I'm not even talking about Kanye as a as an artist. I mean, yeah. just like from a product standpoint, product. it's just like the dude just says he's doing something. Now it's Donda Academy has like some of the best basketball talent in the country. Yeah, man. Like, it's like how? it's like you know it's like when you hear him talk. Yeah, you don't. He doesn't really talk about all these like products and ventures right. really so much, or he does, but he does it in passing. It's a super quick, and it's right. just like or it's like scattered a little scattered, bit, scattered, you know, and then two yeah. months later, it's fully fleshed it's out. Fully and fleshed <laughs> out. like you know, Don Academy's here, and, you know. So yeah, I, so Hip Boy cool. kind of reminds me of that yeah. in a sense, where it's just like you know, he just operate. He just always putting stuff out, yeah, and in high quality. Yeah, it's like sometimes you hear Kanye talk I'm like, man, I don't believe you. You ain't dropping nothing. You, you, you're not gonna drop that company or that product. Not. And two months later, you're like, oh, he was telling the truth. Yeah, he wasn't just bullshitting the way yeah. he was talking. <laughs> People like that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love, I love, I love that. Yeah. Um. Okay. So you know, I want to get into sports stuff a little bit, if that's okay, because yeah. I know I follow your journey, man. Yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah. I love what you do. And um, when you announced that you were going to. To, to get mm-hmm. to to become a uh, an agent in the mm-hmm. sports world, I know it's probably like a new, still still kind of a new venture for you to be a part of that. Right. Talk a little bit about the reasons why you wanted to get into the sports world, and and how's it going? How's it going? Yeah, yeah. So I would say um, I'm I was a ba- I'm a basketball first person. I mean, I grew up playing basketball. I played AU basketball. You know, play play competitive high level high school basketball in, in Jersey. And um, so I thought basketball. Was, if it wasn't gonna be architecture, I thought basketball. Um, Were you a point guard? I was a point guard who didn't pass much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like a new age, like yeah. a lot of these combo yeah. guards, like you know. Uh, combo. Everyone's a combo guard. Now. Everyone's a, exactly. Yeah, everyone's a combo guard. I always say in my hometown, I say I was the first combo guard. Yeah. I, I, I used to market myself as like a, a combo guard. Um, so I always thought basketball was it. Who you did know, you model I, your game after? Uh, who do, who, Drew Holiday. He was a guy who was when I was. He was in Philly for a while, and I was always like a. Oh. I liked in Lou Will. I liked Drew, oh, Drew Holiday Lou. and Lou Will. Lou would just get you buckets. He wouldn't do anything Man. else. Just Lou, get you buckets. Automatic. Just All, off the game, bench. Boom. You know, no yeah. hard distance. Tunnel vision. Yeah. Lou and, Will. And I could I could dunk, but I was never. Whoa. I'm not a freak athlete. You know, I, I'm a better athlete than. You know, if you play basketball every day, you're gonna be a solid athlete. All right, we just need somebody to pull up the highlights. <laughs> we, need, we need to so, see somebody. So, so you know, I got, but like you know, Lou when he he could dunk, but he he wasn't really trying to dunk on you. It was runners, mid range jumpers, you know, stuff like that. So, um, but sports has been, you know, I, a lot of the issues when you talk about the producer community and um, the artist community, it's the same sort. Like for me, I thought like, yeah. oh, we, we need more operators in in. And athletes, and I also think that like people from music might even be better to cap help artists capitalize in yeah. this new era, especially with NIL, um, to help these people monetize their brand. Because in music, you you do it every day. That's like you know how do you go on TikTok and make a video to to help you you know help galvanize your fan base. But like on in sports, it's definitely less of a common. That's just not what was done in the past. You actually you know your coach used to tell you worry about the games. You know like. Yeah. Focus on the game, son. Like you know, um, and it's clearly not happening. That's not what's going to happen. They're not one dimensional no more. Yeah, they're not, they're, not, they're, doing, not, they're right. doing all kind of stuff. Right. So for first, I I just thought nil was a great great opportunity yeah, for for, sure. for for me to come help people. And you know, I work work with a few athletes um, at the college level, and you know, cool. it's fit and it's very passive stuff. I mean, it's like oh, you need to help get you need to help yourself get make some merch or. Yeah, how do I like you mm-hmm. know start doing some of this stuff and yeah. it, you know it's stuff that again we've been doing and in, in, if you're in the music side of the business it's like oh this is like easy like right um, I think the, the goal simple of branding what, stuff they weren't getting that they weren't getting that kind of like advice yep 
and I think the goal for me though, I think the next five to ten years is kind of helping the same way I've been doing it in the artist side, helping artists build their own companies and infrastructures and. I think about the likenesses of some of these athletes and how how dude, much so they were under now. they're they're, yeah. they're, they're undervaluing their I, like I just saw the T Macs are getting re released and I'm like yeah that's like a if T Mac would have knew that coming in or at least early on you know the value of T Mac's IP and some of the shoes and stuff yeah. he was creating you know I don't I'm not sure what his likeness and his products make on a yearly basis now I'm sure that uh, you know there's a there's a it's a solid number. But like, man, it, it he he it could be more, and I just want to help more athletes, sort of, in this new creator on, economy, build their business. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting, man, because um, we've had college athletes who are also producers mm -hmm. uh, be really successful on a platform, but they could never say who they were. Right, they had to go under aliases. Right, and then one day, um, yeah, and then. Later on, we find like if they go pro or they they stop you know they stop playing ball or whatever you know we find out oh wow this this dude was a, yeah the, I know the, I know a couple too yeah <laughs> yeah like oh this guy's plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers oh this guy I know like you you know what I'm talking about yeah. right so it's like um, it's cool man it's cool to see that you know Kevin Durant makes beats yeah. you, you're uh, um, Andre Andre Drummond buys beats on BeatStars we yeah. make we make packs for him we give him we give him beats you know he's right he's, you know. Um, um, uh, Bagley. Bag. I was gonna say Marvin ba Bagley. Yeah, yeah, Bagley's always getting beats on a platform, yeah. and just so many artists. Are, I mean, so many um, um, athletes that are part of the music stuff, and I love how active they are. Um, and and yeah, man, they need representation on that stuff. They're not, you know. And then with the podcasting as well too. Like some of my some of my favorite podcasts, and you know, it's from from athletes. It's from, from athletes. Yeah. It's the best stuff, it's the dude. Best content right now. Like and I, you know, I, during during the bubble, like yeah. during the bubble. Um, your guy in Philly, what's his name? Um, uh, Tybel. Oh, Matisse. Yep, Matisse. Yep, Matisse yep. Tybel uh, had his, you know, behind the scenes kind of like vlog, mm. vlogging throughout the bubble. And he was creating this great high quality content. And it was like interviews and like behind the scenes. It was dope as fuck, it's dude. It's awesome. Yeah. There's so much like potential like, for a lot of these guys to like, you know, so I think squeezing the potential from some of these brands, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, think about your five or six year window of being hot and on top or having the ability because you know I don't, I don't know what the average NBA career is um, but I'm sure it's closer to, to three or four or five years than it is to 11 or 15 right so you think about those average how do you squeeze the most from that and you know you should be leaving the the NBA or the, with a real built community like in a real brand and a real culture around yourself that you could take and deal, do build product or do what else you want, whatever you want to do with yeah. that. With that and they, they need help, right? Yeah, they, need they need guidance. Help. They need yeah. guidance. So that's so. Is there like a specific type of persona, specific specific type of athlete that you're when you're when you're looking for? Yeah, I think they right have potential now, to do all kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's not even about you know. I think there's obviously you know you're looking for the most talented players, but really mm -hmm. just the people with the minds that you want to help shape in a pop proper. Like you know, LeBron's a different animal. Like, and mm -hmm. comparing anybody to what LeBron has done from a media, he's the Mount Rushmore of, I think, just creator economy in general. I mean, the dude has Spring Hill and puts out some of the best documentaries and films. That, yeah. Like, you know, so his team, the way he's empowered his team, you know, it's, it's hard to replicate. But I do think what he did show you was um, a lot of the avenues and arenas that, you know, that are unconventional can and should be done. And you have... Probably, and you have, and what you have the ability to do is, if you're an athlete, um, is to raise money in way that you're you're, cl a lot, you're closer to a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. Like, so how do you get these ideas, put these ideas together, raise capital, and and execute? So I think that's, I, you know, I want to help these guys do that. Yeah, so many media brands wanting to do partner content partnerships with with these athletes. It's awesome, man. I love I love the way I love the way it's good. What are what are some of your favorite podcasts that you listen to from, from the athlete side? Um. I know JJ Reddick's is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the, the, what's the football guys? Um, I think pivot. Channing. Yeah, oh, pivot. Yeah, yeah, the pivot. Pivot. Yeah, the pivot's pivot. amazing. Yeah, yeah. That one's really good. That's probably my favorite right now. Yeah, that's good. That's high quality content, man. So I, I think those those are good. And then 
Uh, all the smoke. You all know, the I smoke. I can't forget all the smoke. All yeah. the smoke. That's Matt, right. That's Matt, Matt and Stack are getting too comfortable right now. They're not. They're not the. They, when they first came in, they were. You know, they were having these hungrier, hungrier interviews. But yeah. they're becoming too professional now. <laughs> <laughs> but shout out to Matt and Stack, man. Yeah. I love those guys too. Uh, knuckleheads, you gotta, you gotta watch. Knuckleheads, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta listen yeah. to Knuckleheads. Um, there's some amazing like yeah. athlete podcasts not, out there. This is uh, so this good. Is, uh, for all the bad Dray, out I, there. I, I love Draymond. Oh, Drake, come on. I, I, how do I forget Draymond? <laughs> that dude, Draymond, is the man. Yo, Draymond's hilarious. Yo, yeah. he's such a leader, man. Yeah. I think he's my favorite NBA player of all time. On court, on court. Sick. You know, everyone always says he's gonna be one of the not worst Hall of Famers, but like. You know, I think people question his Hall of Fame status, and I'm like, I I, I don't want to say he did just as much for the game as Steph, because that's crazy. But when you talk about positionless basketball, guys who actually can guard the five and initiate the offense. I mean, you know, we talk about a dude who averages almost, you know, ten assists, and you know, but can actually guard fives, right? Like actually, there's a lot of people who say there's in theory that they can guard all five. No, this guy can guard point guards and centers. Bro, I'm a, you know, I'm a, you know. So I'm, now I'm, everyone goes small ball in the playoffs and all this other stuff, and it's it's hard for me not to say that Draymond wasn't, you know, uh, one of the leading people who inspired that brand of basketball. You know what I love about him the most, though, and I love his I love his defensive prowess. Of course, like yeah. put him on put him on anyone, he's guarding you regardless of position. The way he controls the tempo of the game. And changes the tempo when it's needed to be changed, and gets the super. He tells the superstars what pace we need to we need to start moving at, yeah. or he tells the superstars what side of the what side of the floor we need to start working on. Like the guy is like, a f- the, I, when it comes to basketball IQ, I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that. What he does, dude, One he's literally best. a coach on the floor. And when he's when he's not playing, and when he's not playing, dude, we suck. Yeah. We suck. One so I don't, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. You know, I'm a Warriors fan, so you know, I'm watching yeah, all that shit. We finally got another. Yeah, 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 we got yeah, another yeah. one. We got another yeah. one. Um, yeah, man. So listen, we're getting we're getting close to the end here. Yep. We covered we covered a lot of topics. Um, I think you know we we shared your journey. Um, you know, congratulations on everything you're doing. Thank I you, can't man. wait to continue to see the operation of Eagle grow and go yeah. crazy and. Um, all these amazing partnerships, but you know, we still you know we still know you as. The original producer lawyer, you know what I mean? Like the, all, nah, you know what I'm saying? You're yeah. always going to be ours, yep. you know what I mean? Regardless of all the big things you're doing, sports and artists, you're still going to be, you, we're going to claim you no matter what. Right. Um, and I know, I know the community is like probably hanging on, hanging on right now, just like, what is Abe going to ask this guy? Because I think, you know, they always get this, they always get this advice from you, and they, you know, you're always putting out educational material. But on some real shit, what what two things, one or two things that you would tell producers that are, you know, getting major placements now, dealing with dealing with you know major companies, but also building online businesses? What what two pieces of things you would have them focus on right now, man, in terms of their careers? I would say there's a lot of rhetoric, I think, in in the community producer community that says you don't need a manager or, and you know, you get an attorney, just handle your paperwork and that. It's true, but I mean, a manager or someone on your admin, I, I think a lot of producers need admin help, you know, just like the reality, like practicality of. So I think, you know, embrace management in a, in a, in a way that um, will benefit your career, you know, people who can help you get opportunities. But, you know, even if it's more of an admin focus, I think you can't undervalue someone on your team helping you get your business organized organized across the board. So I think as you're looking for a manager, you know, making sure, make sure that, you know, they know, you know, how to collect your royalties, not just here, but across the globe. Um, you know, their, their liaison and all those important relationships, you know, with BeatStars and whoever your publisher is, if you have one, and the artist team and your attorney. Um, and obviously you'll still always be involved, but there's a real value add to that because I think a lot of people I've been talking to, think, you know, an attorney is it, you know, you can have the attorney just handle my paperwork. For some producers, it could work, you know, um, but I think to really scale your operation, um, you know, having another person on your team, and particularly, you know, on the management side, what would do you wonder? So, um, and then the last thing I would say is um, world, just folk, royalty collection, and I, mean, I think just know 
how, when, and where you should be getting paid. You know, it's very, it's a very mundane or bad topic, but the amount of producers just don't know where their royalties are supposed to come from. It's just, at this point, it's like, come mm -hmm. on, man. And there's a lot of... There's a lot of info out there, so just just really focus on where you're getting your money, and it'll it'll allow you it'll help you in terms of forecasting revenue, um, you know what your BMI ASCAP checks gonna look like, you know what your royalty should look like, you know from your points and um, you know all that info is just 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 important info you to have. Yeah. Amazing man, I know you said you know these copyrights, you know these you know we're selling them and like a lot of lot of artists are selling them at big 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 valuations and there could have been so much lost potential yeah on on what they could be done and so producers like you said like Carl said you know um, yeah understand the operation of your business understand where all the opportunities are to to leverage your your your, your music and and get out of the shadows get out of the shadows get out of the shadows stop trying to do it alone you know try to build a team and um, there's a lot of earning potential out there for you. Yeah, Carl, thank you so much yep. for all this the advice, awesome. man. Sharing yeah. your story, sharing your time with us, bro. We're thankful for you. Yep. We we needed you the last few years yep. for the community. Thank you, man. Trust and me. Um, appreciate it. yeah, man. So I appreciate you, and um, thanks for being on the podcast, man. Thank you, man. Yes, sir. <laughs> we got the game in a chokehold. Not paying the creators is a no no.